Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar um, in partnership between the Texas System of Care and the National Building Bridges Initiative. My name is Lillian Stengart, and I'm the project director for the Texas System of Care at the Health and Human Services Commission. And the Texas System of Care is very pleased to be partnering with the National Building Bridges Initiative and the Youth Development Institute for today's webinar. This webinar is the first of a series of webinars that BBI is providing to assist Texas RTCs with the implementation of best practices intended to improve long-term outcomes for children and families who receive residential treatment center services. We are hopeful that this webinar series will provide useful strategies and practical ideas for your organizations to implement to provide child and family-centered care. At the conclusion of today's webinar, there will be an evaluation that we encourage you to complete for those of you wishing to receive social work continuing education credits, the evaluation must be completed. Um, to start off today's webinar, we have Sherry Hammock, the National Coordinator of the Building Bridges Initiative here with us. Sherry has over 37 years of experience with uh, federal, state, and local level community work and especially with um, um, strategic planning. And previous to um, Sherry's current position as the national coordinator, she was the project director for the Texas System of Care and um, developed the current framework um, that we have in place. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Sherry. Thank you, Lillian. And I so appreciate partnering with all my buddies here in Texas as they're working across the country with Building Bridges Initiative as well. And really want to th thank Texas System of Care and um, the work that's going on there, as well as the, the Institute for Excellence in Mental Health at the University of Texas, who's helping sponsor a lot of the System of Care work and certainly this webinar today. So today our topic, and I'm going to kick us off, and you'll get to hear folks from the Youth Development Institute um, out in Arizona, boots on the ground, and I know we're anticipating wanting to hear from them, but I want to kick us off and talk a little bit about the frame for building bridges and some of the work that's going on within Texas and certainly around the country. So this particular webinar is moving from controlling practices to collaborative practices and very much is aligned with some of the same values with um, system of care and, and other complementary values that um, are being practiced in, as far as best practices are concerned. Let me see if I can get these to advance. I wanted to mention quickly about some of the top trends that we're seeing, and actually this was reported out in 2014, so you could probably check our work and, and see if this is true, but we're, I think everyone's expected that we're seeing less money um, from local, state, and federal governments as, as far as residential services, or certainly when folks are purchasing residential services that they want to see and buy results um, in addition to the service provision of, of, of residential intervention. And really looking at emphasis on results that can be sustained after discharge so that um, what is being done in residential is something that is going to have positive effects after the child or youth return home or to um, their alternate placement. And then there's really this trend and movement from going from a child center to family-focused service delivery. That's something that has been projected and a faster movement towards permanency for children who are not re returning home, you know, that, that we're looking for. Um, you know, what is the permanent place for that child and hopefully it's in a safe and nurturing um, home, that that's the best place that research tells us for kids to grow up in. 
So the Building Bridges initiative, and it's certainly when I first started with this, I, I was thinking the Building Bridges part was between community-based services and residentially-based services. And I have found and learned that really there's many bridges that we're concentrating on and, and building. And the framework for BBI is really to promote practice and policy initiatives that that create a close alignment and a partnership and actually collaborative practice between families, youth, community, and residentially based treatment service providers, as well as advocates and policy makers to ensure that we have that continuum of care and that we do business in a way that is grounded in the values of being family driven, youth guided, strength based, and culturally and linguistically competent that we're focusing on individualized services and really preparing youth for be going back to their home or back to independent living in the community, and that we do have some science or some evidence and data behind the practice that we're doing, and again, that we're consistent with the research on sustained positive outcomes. So that's, that's the frame for BBI, and I would um, offer to you that if you're interested, and the BBI website that you'll see on several of the slides is very robust and has a lot of information. But I would encourage you to look especially at the joint resolution. And um, if you're interested in being a partner with the joint resolution and, and really saying that we're committed to this goal and, and aim, that you could email um, Dr. Gary Blau, who's the branch director for Child and Adolescent Family Services under the federal branch of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or Beth Caldwell, who's our uh, BBI director, or you can certainly send myself an email and just say you would like to endorse the BBI joint resolution. And that would also put you on a listserv to receive new, newly developed documents. So for example, we just came off, hot off the press with a judge's guide, you know, um, that speaks to, you know, residential intervention too. And so that, those documents that have been developed by experts around the country, you would be able to see some of those. And you would also be on the listserv to be invited the first to BBI events which we're hoping to have a national training event um, this fall. So you could be on that list to be able to, to go and, and hear directly like we are today uh, from experts around the country. So this is, that's, this is that statement is with the, the joint resolution that you would say, not that you have arrived necessarily, but you um, are committed to striving to really eliminate coercion and coercive interventions like um, seclusion restraint and adversive practices. So there's a direct link to the, the joint resolution and I think um, many times that's what brings providers into this arena is to say I really want to reduce uh, restraint and seclusion but then the how-tos, that's, that's the hard part and I think there's a lot of um, work that's been done on this and we have some frame, framework and some practices to offer. So some of the documents and articles that are supporting the field and especially including system of care communities are, um, you can find on the BBI website as well. And, and here's a list, I won't read through all of those, but like tip sheets for, um, for youth that are coming into residential or family, um, tip sheets and um, just generally supportive documents that help help whether it's the receiver services or the people providing services think about um, things that would support best practice and implementation. And so here also, you know, this I think like I mentioned the tip sheet for um, youth advisory councils, you're going to hear a little bit more about that um, from the folks at YDI here in a few minutes. But here's other, an, another critical component is family finding and engagement. So sometimes the young people that we have coming into residential for re residential intervention are disconnected from families and looking at um, really that function of what's going to happen and, and where 
are they going to go and where do they want to go after uh, residential intervention. So anyway, here's some, here's some documents that speak to these different topics that I invite you to go to the BDI website and um, read about those. The other thing is, and we're all, or many of us are interested in getting continuing education um, units. Um, so here is a site with the Institute at the University of Maryland, and these are BDI related programs that you can go and listen to and gain CEUs as well. And again, you can see the different topics that, um, that support those. So, and then, um, as you can tell, I think many of these, these guides and tip sheets are uh, available and um, you can access them on the BBI website. So here's another list of different ones, um, especially like even for state decision makers, you know, looking at Medicaid regulations that impact residential best practices and recommendations for improvement there. So I, I'd also I, I be remiss if I didn't mention I didn't that there is a, a book that outlines outline all the different all subjects of best practices where residential intervention is concerned. And um, here's the information on how to order that. And that really was done with many different experts around the country that are doing services, that are service providers. There's also um, state oversight, you know, um, leaders, and I think that a great job in getting contact information in the book, so if you want to learn more, that you can contact someone. If for some reason that contact information doesn't work, I would invite you to contact me or anyone at BBI, which I have a slide at the end, that, and we can put you in touch with someone that has kind of been there, done that, and can help provide some information. So I, I rattle these off kind of quickly, but here they are listed, is the core principles and values that we have in, uh, in informing this framework are family-driven and youth-guided care, um, truly being culturally and linguistic competent, and looking at clinical excellence and quality standards and the way we're doing business, and accessibility and community involvement, looking at that continuum. And paying particular attention to transition planning and services between whatever settings, you know, but really for youth, getting them prepared for um, adulthood. In some of this work, I really wanted to speak to real quickly just some of, some of the research, and there's, there's more to be had, but looking at their research on residential effectiveness and recidivism, there's one state that they had you know, when they looked at a year post-discharge, they had 68% of their youth that was back in out-of-home care, whether it's a, a psychiatric hospital or, or justice system or, um, or residential system, as opposed to um, an, an entity, Daymar Services, which is out of Indiana and a BBI implementer, that they're up to, and I'm, to, just to update this slide, really the range is 3 to 15 percent, that they're looking at 3 to 15 percent of their population that may be back in out-of-home care within three to five years post-discharge. So really looking at what is the data telling us and how are we um, implementing, driving decisions based on data to promote more positive, sustained outcomes post-discharge. And one of the outcomes or one of the things that we want to pay attention to is shortening lengths of stay. <clears throat> so like in New York State, I know that um, in this situation, in this study below, they had transitional coordinators. And in New York State, the, the transitional coordinator was located in the residential program or in their PRTS, the Partial Residential Treatment Facility. and um, and then in Florida, when they had that same type of position that's really looking at transitioning young people back into the community, that person was in the, com the community. And so I think it really takes on, those positions will take on the culture of the program and they had better outcomes for um, less than six months length of stay 
where they had the transitional coordinator out in the community. So I just wanted to point out some of the research that um, is brought to bear that can help help drive some of the decisions on um, how we're creating the framework and how we're promoting services. And so here I want, again, I want to get over to um, YDI, but here's some of some points about not putting all our eggs in one basket as far as an over-reliance on congregate care because, the, frankly, the evidence is just not pointing to that. So we really want to work in tandem with community-based services and work in tandem with families and young people in supporting what's going to happen after um, residential care. And so here's a slide with um, Dr. Blau, the, the um, SAMHSA Federal, the Ch Children and Adolescent Branch Director, and then Beth and Kelly um, and myself who are su helping support the BBI, the Building Bridges Initiative. And so if you have more questions, you can certainly contact us and we can follow up. And I know that we're going to entertain questions in the chat box initially, and we'll open up the, the phone lines if needed. But if you have questions during the presentations, then please um, type those in if you have access to a computer. And as we move along, we can um, entertain or clarify and respond to those questions and, um, and get to those. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Trish courses at Arizona and she is the co-executive director for the Youth Development Institute and this is a nonprofit organization that provides residential and outpatient behavioral health services to youth and Trish and her husband she's going to introduce the rest of her team there but really has been doing this work since 1970 and Trish has been the driving force behind YDI's reduction in seclusion and restraint and the implementation of trauma-informed care. And um, I have come to learn that Trish was born in Texas, in Houston, Texas. So there's uh, a little bit of Texas sprinkled in with in Arizona there with who we're going to hear from, from Trish and David and their team. So at this time, I'll turn it over to Trish. And thank you so much ahead of time for sharing your expertise and experience. Trish? Thank you, Sherry. Um, yeah, with me today, part of our team is, uh, of course, David Kokoris, our my co-founder and co-executive director and also spouse, and our executive clinical director, Maria Lopez-Smith. We also have with us uh, the sponsor of our um, student advisory board, uh, Charlie Molina. Charlie has worked with this board since uh, we turned it into a board and uh, has been part of the reason we've been so successful with this implementation. We also have uh, Brittany, who is here as a student advisory board member, and she will be talking to you in just a little bit about her experience and what the student advisory board does. I need a little technical assistance, Glenn. It's not, it's not moving the slide with the arrow key. There. Okay, I can do it that way. Yeah. Um, YDI was formed in 1996, and uh, we began operating as a 14-bed facility and then went to a, um, uh, a little bit larger, uh, 21 beds. Then we added the group home, and sooner or later we wound up here um, at our present location in 1999, where we have 84 secure residential beds and 48 therapeutic group home beds. We also have outpatient services and um, an on-site school that serves the kids. I can help advance slides, Trish, on this end. Okay, I, I, I may have it now. 
Okay. The uh, kids we serve are both male and female in between the ages of 10 and 17. Um, the kids present with serious difficulties in regulation, emotional regulation, and have behavior disorders. They also present as danger to self or danger to others. And we have a, a specialized program for kids with sexually abusive behavior um, that we call our journey unit. Um, David and I began uh, attempting to transform our programs uh, back when we first were exposed to uh, building bridges in about 2011. And uh, we recognized that for us to change our residential intervention, we would need to be transformative in our leadership. And that would involve creating a new vision, embarking on a new mission, and breaking down the barriers and overcoming resistance because the changes that we have implemented are um, not the usual methods in residential. So part of that is to begin with the end in mind, that we no longer think of the end as a successful discharge um, when the kid leaves our door, um, but a, a um, permanence in the home and community and getting them home to family and keeping them home with their family, that that's what success is defined as. There are a lot of coercive um, and controlling methods that residential programs use um, with kids, and seclusion and restraint is probably one of the more controlling and coercive, um, but also points and level systems, institutionalized jargon, um, not letting kids have contact with their family for three, five, 30, 60 days, um, having to earn passes and visits with their family, and focusing on following the program rules, um, and defining success as compliance with the program structure as if that <coughs> compliance was somehow going to impact how they behaved and functioned in their home, their school, and their community. So it was kind of like experiencing that a lot of the things we thought of as appropriate for residential treatment um, were like finding out that the earth was not flat anymore, that it really was round, and that we had to really reinvent and rethink a lot of the things, all of the things that we, we do as providers. So where did we start? Again, we begin with this end in mind, that the long-term positive outcome for residential Interventions is sustained permanent for use at home, with family, and in the community. And no longer are we just a factory where a kid gets dropped off and we fix them and then they get picked up at our doorway. Uh, we recognize our responsibility goes a lot further than that. YDI has been through three major transformations. The first was our youth guided care. Um, and that was the implementation of our student advisory board. The second was to eliminate restraints, um, which required some real paradigm shifts for everybody here. And the third one was our Building Bridges project, which uh, provides services in the home soon after admission and increases those home-based services and then at discharge continues those services um, so that we ensure permanence in the home. Before March of 2011, YDI had a student council that was primarily activity oriented. Okay. Hi, this is David. I'm going to introduce the youth guided uh, component of our program. Uh, so, Trish said, in, uh, before 2000, March of 2011, we always had a student council, but, you know, it was just more activity oriented. And the sponsors, you know, lasted probably three or four months, and then they really wanted to hand it off to somebody else. And uh, it just it just wasn't cutting it for youth guided care. And then uh, I was able to attend a BBI presentation and got really jazzed about, you know, the possibility of, of transforming our student council uh, into something that really gave our kids a voice in the operations of our program. So I just sort of threw it out there to our staff, 
and uh, said, you know, I mean, this is the direction that we're going to head, and just sort of left it wide open in where we went, and uh, and it was sort of scary to give the, the kids such a voice in our programming, but I tell you what, we've been rewarded many times over uh, for making that, that move. Uh, so just a couple of key points before I turn it over to Charlie and Brittany. Uh, first of all, Student Advisory Board and all the other transformations that we go through, it, it's not a sprint for sure. It's definitely a marathon. And so, you know, start on something, get it going, and, you know, keep evolving over time. So when we started the Student Advisory Board, I, I think one of the key, key things for me is that I really needed to find the champions. And uh, I was incredibly fortunate to land Charlie as one of the the sponsors of the Student Advisory Board, and he really bought off on the BBI principles. And the other lesson that I learned is that I needed to be personally involved uh, quite heavily in the beginning, and that uh, I attended every meeting they had, and because I was there, we were able to take action very quickly. I mean, I could summon department heads when the kids brought up an issue, and we could take care of it immediately. So. That was, that was a lesson that I want to pass on to you. I think your highest level administrators need to be personally involved uh, to get this thing going and heading in the right direction. Uh, I can also tell you now that we've been doing it for a few years is that I don't have to do that. Uh, and in fact, my workload has decreased since we have the Student Advisory Board. So uh, one day when I was in uh, Bismarck, North Dakota, getting ready to do a presentation uh, there for BBI. And uh, I remember it was minus 15 degrees. And all of a sudden I realized that our student advisory board was definitely part of our workforce, you know, that it had become that over the years. And uh, I think that you'll understand that more as Brittany and Charlie uh, talk about what they do in the Student Advisory Board, and I think what you'll see is that much of what they do, uh, I used to pay people to do it, and and so uh, we, we just still pay Charlie. Yeah, we still <laughs> yeah we pay Charlie, but uh, but anyway, it's it's been a magnificent trip for us, and I hope it is for you too. So I'm going to turn it over to Brittany and Charlie. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. I'm Brittany. And I'm Charlie. So we'll just go over the, some history stuff quickly. Um, we started off student advisory in 2011 um, based upon the Building Bridges initiative and the tip sheet that's actually on the Building Bridges website that helped us get the ball rolling. Um, since then, we'll share what we've grown into. Um, just so you know, basically that's how we operate. The student advisory board, um, how it runs, it's run by the boys and girls that actually live here. You know, the current members select future members. They represent all the population. It's not that we just pick the kids that are doing well, it's the representation of everybody. We look at being part of the student advisory is not a privilege, it's part of you know your community and your voice, your choice. So to kind of get that ball rolling, you can see actually up here we have our, student, we have our mission statement, but Brittany, I mean, how would you summarize what student advisory is in your own words? Um, to me personally, I think of student advisory as basically a democracy where we represent it, we represent people, clients that live here, and we listen to their concerns and try to make YDI better. Cool. So when you talk about making things better, now we're getting to the really cool stuff because we're talking about what we actually do. So let them know what are some of the things that we've done as student advisory. Oh, we did a lot, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> we hire and train new staff. Um, trainings we do role plays. And then we get in a circle with the staff, and we tell them what it's like to be in YDI. YDI. And then we we do that because we develop empathy with the staff, and they develop empathy with us. Um, we hire and train YCWs, therapists, teachers, and even some directors. So, so let me step back. So when you say hire, what does that mean exactly? What if you find a staff that you don't think is qualified? Um, if we don't think they're qualified, Trish and Dave won't hire them. 
and that's that's a really big expression of how much they value yeah. your guys' opinion, isn't it? Yes. And that's absolutely true. Well, that's just the beginning. That's just talking about hiring new staff. Mm -hmm. Get into it. What are some of the other things that we do? Um, we resolve grievances with peer-on-peers, -peer, so we do mediations and problem solving. Um, I feel like the reason why we do that is because sometimes as clients we see more uh, under the radar type of stuff and, and then adults do and it's also good for us to learn how to problem solve ourselves. So I think that's, that's good. Keep going. What else? Um, we also review and rewrite policies and expectations. We reviewed and rewrite the grievance process, pink slip, dress code, room decoration, rules, and client surveys. That's all, that's all what we have a say in. Um, we also do client tours to make the new client feel comfortable, supported, and safe in their new environment. We also do tours basically whenever they tell us. <laughs> if someone, <laughs> someone's interested in how we work, we do tours. Um, we also participate in committees with adults, so like SQUIG or wellness slash dietary. Um, SQUIG is yeah, that's a good question. staff. Uh, quality improvement group. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, talk about the wellness one for a second, because um, what you're talking about is you actually come to meetings with adults who are trying to make things better here. Yeah. What are some of the things you've done in the dietary meeting? Um, we've t we talk about how the food is, if it's you know gross, or <laughs> <laughs> if we have concerns about it, you know, if they overcook or undercook their food, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Yeah, you missed that one, but what happened with the juices and everything? We've oh, yeah, I forgot about that one. <laughs> we also, um, we tasted new juice ma juice machines that um, are actually pretty good. Yeah. yeah, so essentially when the dietary staff was talking about bringing new stuff in, new things to eat, they wanted the kids' opinions. And since we have these kids who are really good at communicating and giving their opinion and helping mm -hmm. and they listen, we listen to them that we, we have these people that can help us make us better. So when we talk about all this different stuff, we're talking about the things that student advisory is doing to make us better as an agency. Yes. But what has student advisory done to help you as a person? Um, student advisory has helped me with my social skills, being open and accepting feedback, being accountable for my actions, being able to read body language. I've also found a lot of support, and I've also realized that I am not alone in my situation and that I do not have to control everything. Excellent. So what we're talking about here is outcomes for you. Mm -hmm. And actually what they can see on the screen there, this is from one of our first kids that joined student advisory. And this is something that I still quote to this day when I talk to kids about the impact it has. Just when we did a training class yesterday, we talked about how the work they're doing at helping new staff train to learn what it's like from our youth position, that they're going to be helping people years from now. Mm -hmm. It gives them a sense of belonging and purpose. And the smiles on their faces, it's, it's a really cool thing. I really like what we get to do with this. Mm -hmm. so, and as a result of doing really cool things, you get really, really cool results. And here they are. So we like to keep a lot of data around here. And in looking at the Student Advisory Board, uh, you, can, you can see the results that 93% uh, successful discharge rate for kids that are in the Student Advisory Board or have been in the Student Advisory Board. And we've had over 100 kids now uh, be a part of the Student Advisory Board. And so, gosh, it just sort of hit us, you know, going, well, this is probably one of our greatest interventions for the kids with that kind of successful discharge rate. So uh, when, we, when we found out that, we decided, well, we have to provide more opportunities for more kids to be part of the Student Advisory Board. So uh, I'd like for Charlie to talk a little bit about some of the steps that we took to be more inclusive. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is, came from our directors. You know, you have a therapeutic module. How do we actually get it to help more kids? And so with that directive, we took that to our kids, and they embraced it. A um, couple things. When you apply for a job, you interview. And then if you are selected, you get the job. Our kids came up with ideas like, well, that's not really a good idea. What if the people that wanted a job actually did the job for a few weeks or a month? You have more kids actually learning how to do this, getting those skills. And I'll talk about those more in a second. So in addition to that, something to look at is not only who's going to be really helpful, but also who is this going to help? 
So when the kids are talking about people joining, okay, that's one of the criteria is like, you know, who's this going to benefit? Who could use more additional social skills or who would actually, you know, be coming out of their shell or learn something that's going to help them in their treatment by actually participating in something with so much reach. Some of those things that they get that I was talking about, the skills, the, mem the members of the Student Advisory Board, they get training in mediation, okay? They can receive training in professional interviewing, uh, giving constructive feedback is when they're training the staff. They're actually giving feedback as far as how to say things to get people to listen. They receive training in actually sensory modulation, not how to actually do it for themselves, but how to teach it to other people. And, and it goes on and on for the skills that they're acquiring, skills that actually help make people successful in their lives outside of this. I've had kids come back that talk about how when they go for job interviews outside of here, they've been through 100 with adults. So when they go in the interview, they feel completely comfortable with it. Oh, as far as the entire community? Well, when we talk about inclusive, I mean, that's what it's doing. So when you have things like that happening, when you can provide all those skills to more of your population, I don't know how to, our success rate's going to be even higher. We don't know how many people we're going to reach. Yeah. But we know that it's absolutely something that should be shared with all of our community. So what we found is that giving kids voice in their treatment, in how the place is run, in things that impact them directly, um, they've stepped up to that responsibility and um, it has made us a better agency for it. Um, we began our, our efforts to reduce restraints um, back in 2007, 2008, um, when we were introduced to the six core strategies by um, a Joint Commission surveyor. And we consistently in performance improvement targeted restraint reduction as an objective. But an objective is not an imperative. So when we adopted the six core strategies, we really looked hard um, at ourselves and our preconceived notions as, as leaders. Um, we looked at how data could inform our practice. We looked at workforce development, which now includes our student advisory board. We looked at how we could fully include individuals and families and um, how we could use restraint reduction tools uh, to make the environment of care more uh, responsive and calming to the kids in our care. And then if an, an event of a restraint or seclusion occurred, we would rigorously debrief it. These six core strategies have been around for, uh, I guess, about 12 years now, and uh, they really have helped us um, in reducing our restraints. But like every program, we've kept data <laughs> for a long time. And so back in 2007, you can see we were up there in the, in, uh, the nearly 60 a month um, average. Um, in 2008 and 2009, we were able to drop that to about eight a month average. And then um, not long thereafter, though, um, there's always a reason that restraints go back up. It, uh, there's always a rationale for why that happened. And uh, by the time that Beth Caldwell came here in June of 2012 um, to visit us, she liked a lot of what she saw. She especially liked our student advisory board. Um, but she simply said that we were restraining kids too much because at that, by that time we were averaging 30 restraints a month. So what we had to do is shift the way we thought. We no longer think about reducing restraints. We think about eliminating restraints. So there are no rationales <laughs> for a restraint if you're eliminating them. Um, the thing that we when Beth told us we were traumatizing the kids in our care, um, that really hit home. And we shifted our paradigm to believe that seclusion and restraint are not treatment interventions. They don't keep anybody safe. Um, they're reactions. Seclusion and restraints are demonstration of power and control. They're very traumatizing to the youth in care and also traumatizing to the staff. Often these interventions are implemented in arbitrary, abusive and violent ways. 
And that's just being transparent and telling the truth. In order to eliminate restraints, the leadership has to believe that restraints do harm. Once, none of us gets into this business to try to harm children. So once you believe that restraints harm children, it's, it's, it's an imperative to eliminate them. So we set, we, we believe it's possible to eliminate restraints and we have set our intention to eliminate them. And we have sold it to our staff of 160 youth care workers. Um, and we stopped all the rationalization. We no longer blame the child, the new admission, the very difficult kid, the one that was restrained 20 times in the 20 days before admission here. We stopped all the rationalizations and we use all of the six core strategies. So we had some pretty good results going from that 30 average a month. In December of 2013, we finally hit zero and maintained zero for a while. The beauty of this is that we've been able over the course of two years to continue um, our restraint elimination project, um, but with the success that now we are about at half a restraint a month. The kids are not easier. The kids, if anything, are more difficult, um, but, but we really changed. So what changed was once leadership is on board, you don't have to use the six core strategies in order. We actually jumped to number five, um, looking at our environment of care and the use of sensory modulation, which then led us to trauma-informed care, which Maria is going to talk about. Oh, with initiation of trauma-informed care, um, I would like to say that the biggest change we made was that we had to initiate it right at admission. And so we couldn't wait for a crisis to start and then try to figure out the kid then. We had to start at admission. And so we had to change the way that we admitted um, children into our care. Um, and I think um, Charlie and Brittany talked about introducing the kids to another um, child on their unit right at admission. And so that started um, kind of the introducing them into the sensory um, items right at admission, introducing them to the environment right at admission, introducing um, the kids um, to their unit right at admission. And so that was something that we had to change um, in regards to making the kids comfortable right at admission. Um, also with the safety plans and the self-assessment -assess safety tools, we had to start those things right at admission. Um, and so we try to take care of them right from the start. Um, one of the things that we were doing prior to that was trying to take care of the crisis at the time of the crisis instead of being um, preventative. And so that's one of the things that we really had to change um, right off the bat. So right at admission, um, we had to um, introduce them to things like their MP3 player. We had to let them know that we were going to be a hands-off program. The um, student advisory member that they met right at admission let them know this was a hands-off program, that they were going to be very safe here. Um, we really had to um, do um, get rid of um, any kind of inkling that there was any kind of points or level system. The kids know right off the bat there's not anything like that. Um, we don't have any um, seclusion or restraint rooms. We just have comfort rooms and comfort boxes. Um, and so the kids are introduced to all of that right at admission or as close to admission as, as possible. Um, we allow them to decorate their room, a poster, a blanket, a rug um, that we will get for them if they do not have that. Um, they can also bring it from home, but anything that's in their room that makes them feel comfortable, we um, allow them to bring, bring that with them and decorate their space so that it feels comfortable to them. We also have a hug program. We prefer to hug the kids um, as opposed to restraining them. Any kid that has a history of restraint, again, we recognize that even prior to admission. Um, and if we, they allow us to hug them, then we hug them. We hug them as much as possible um, and as much as they allow us, as much as they can tolerate. Um, if they are a kid that needs extra hugs, we will make a hug t-shirt with them that says that they like hugs. Um, we also have a sensory regulation program um, where we have 
um, items they can play with, like drums. We also have um, benches, the gliders around the facility, where if they need a timeout when they're at school, that the gliders are available to them to take a timeout and they can rock themselves in order to um, just get that rhythmic movement going because they can self-soothe. We also have the, um, the chairs available in the group rooms to help them if they're in group. We have um, chairs in the group rooms that also rock so that they can still participate in group. And we also allow them to take um, coping skills to school and in group that are not distractible, that they can just do like little fidgets in their hands so that they can still pay attention but still have something sensory with them. One of the reasons that I think it's important that leadership be aboard, and that means all leadership, is that the CFO has to be on board. Um, those glider rockers are $700 a piece, but um, how many disruptive incidents they have prevented, I can't count, but I know that the kids stay in group and settle in group much better uh, when they're sitting in the rockers. Mm -hmm. So it's been a, a very successful implementation. And a good trade-off because I know in one of our um, – what are the, some of the data that we have found, which we don't have today, but that there's a lower, because there's less restraints, there's less staff um, injuries. injuries. And mm -hmm. so then there's the company saves costs that way as well. Um, with trauma-informed care, we have um, what we call intervention teams. And so when the youth is experiencing um, frequent incidents of aggression or maybe they've assaulted um, another kid or a staff, we bring them in. And the goal is to resolve any conflicts or repair relationships. Um, usually before those intervention teams, we have met as directors and um, clinical team members, and we've discussed the um, child's history, um, gone over the medications. And the goal with the child is to really figure out, um, to do some collaborative problem solving and to figure out what, what the next step is in order to help them. Um, so we meet with the, with the child and we um, talk about what the problem is, um, where do we think the triggers are coming from, and how we can um, best tackle it from then on. Um, and we've seen a decrease in, self, in staff injuries and also in client injuries since we started the intervention team. Um, we've also um, assigned advocates, so each youth has an advocate um, to support them with unconditional encouragement and support. The advocate also helps them with their treatment goals, checks in with them on a weekly basis, also makes sure that all their basic needs are taken care of, and basically we just have fun with them. We have de-escalation days every week. Uh, we have um, de-escalation events, um, just times where they can have like um, downtime, like where they can just have fun because they don't need to be involved in treatment 24-7. I mean, they are kids. They do need to have time where they are just um, playing games and relaxing and um, just doing kid things. Yeah, and I do want to point out that none of those activities are learned, uh, earned activities. They no. they are, uh, everybody gets to go to the game room, everybody gets to attend any of the events. There's not a behavioral criteria. And as long as they're safe the five minutes before the activity starts. Mm -hmm. We also do youth recognition, and they have, um, especially the catch game dollars, those are things that the youth care workers can pass out to them as often um, as they can catch them doing something well. Um, and then each week they can um, go shopping at the catch game store. Um, also each week the team awards, like a Spotlight of the Week award or a Peer of the Week award, just to recognize kids that are putting forth um, the effort and um, we also have positive incident reports, again, for recognizing kids that are going above and beyond or maybe we're struggling in the area and then the staff have opportunity to recognize improvement in the area. And then we also have staff recognition awards. Part of what we had to do in order to reduce restraints and also become trauma-informed is to focus on the leadership in our, our milieu. We have what we call milieu coordinators and unit coordinators who are direct supervisors of the direct care staff that we call youth care workers. We also have um, identified staff who are code responders. They used to respond to the code yellow as meaning that they had to go and restrain somebody. Now they respond to a code yellow 
um, because we need extra staff to de-escalate a situation and help uh, the kids regulate themselves. So uh, our direct care supervisors are recognized and compensated as professional staff. They make the same amount as my clinician. And um, when it comes time for bonuses, uh, they get a more than a fair share. So code responders and milieu coordinators also take the time to meet with the clients um, on a, like, every shift basis, the clients that we consider to be um, our crisis clients, our clients in most, in most need. They take the time to establish relationships with them so that when there is a crisis, the relationship is already established. And so when they, when they see the code responder, they see the milieu coordinator, the child sees them as the problem solver. So just the fact that they arrived on the scene, the kid starts to calm because they see that the problem is going to be solved right away. Um, so that's always very helpful. Um, the other thing that we did was that we made sure that every staff, that staff at every level were trained in the collaborative problem solving, um, especially the Plan B approach, um, and that they understood just the basic principle that kids do well if they can, that this was not a, um, that this was a lack of skill, not will, that we, our job was to be skill builders. Um, we taught them the sensory regulation activities and also made sure they were well informed about trauma-informed care. So we were able to send them to trainings about Dr. Bruce Perry's work, um, about trauma, um, about the rewiring the brain takes 500 lessons, to not take it personal if the kids weren't let, getting it right away, and then the TSCBT. And so we used a lot of webinars, um, especially the ACRC and um, the Building Bridges. And this, there's a very um, good page in the Treating Explosive Kids that identifies some of the um, concepts we're talking about in regards to the skill, not will. It's a good resource. So what changed? Our old thinking was that restraints are necessary to keep the kids safe. I, I think I mentioned their reaction to an unsafe situation. It's already occurred. Um, we were satisfied with restraint reduction no longer. We look at uh, elimination. We consider each and every restraint as a total failure of our program and the staff from the administrators on down to the direct care staff. We take responsibility in our program for, for what happens. Um, so that kids do well if they can, um, that's a real paradigm shift. Uh, a lot of people in residential treatment think kids, kids do um, well to get what they want, or um, kids will do well if you make them, but it, the, the truth is that they will do well if they can. Why wouldn't they? Um, why wouldn't they do well? If they could, they would. Um, we changed from confront and teach to calm, comfort, and connect. Um, we stopped blaming new admissions and created a therapeutic alliance with the child at admission. And when restraints decreased, assaults on staff increased, and so we responded with the intervention team. Um, and, and that, what else is possible instead of going back to restraints but trying to figure out another way that you can respond to a behavior um, that is effective but is not coercive or controlling. We also found that just like restraints are contagious, emotional regulation is contagious. I always like to po point out that um, our office is at a window at the school. Uh, we have a window that goes out into the school building, and right now there are 120 kids right outside my window. Um, I don't think we've heard any of them because it's, it's very, very calm around here. Um, one of the other um, transformations we had to go through was our Building Bridges Project. Um, so in our Building Bridges Project, um, it was really about um, connecting uh, residential and the community and about getting families engaged right off the bat into getting their children home. Um, so really about family-driven youth-guided services and then building that bridge home. Um, so the participation criteria, just identifying the youth and families as close to admission as possible. And these were the high-risk, high-needs families that had a history of failed 
um, placements, including um, failures at home, repeated placements at home. Um, and there just had to be a potential to go home and um, participation by the parents or, or caregivers. They just had to agree to participate. Um, and we try to um, begin services um, as close as possible to I the identification of um, the parents and caregivers. So as soon as they agree to participate, we try to get them um, into the home. And so our objectives were just about um, helping the, par the family and caregivers gain insight into um, the style that we use here at the facility and then trying to just take what the um, the interventions that we use here at the facility and teaching them to the parents and um, so that they could use them at home and um, to de-escalate any kind of crisis um, and also to reduce the length of stay at the RTC and then to reduce readmissions into out-of-home care. Um, at discharge. At discharge? Mm -hmm, yeah, discharge. Um, Towards, um, towards, the, towards the time of discharge, we would increase the time in the home. So as the kids got closer to the time of discharge, then the um, behavior coach and therapist would increase the time that they were, were spending in the home. So the therapist that was um, teamed up with the behavior coach would continue to go into the home more often towards the end of discharge, preferably up to five days a week between the behavior coach and therapist. They would also be available for crisis calls. And then they would make sure that all barriers that prohibit um, any kind of follow-up with aftercare services are removed. So that would mean including providing services um, to the family, transportation, bus cars, whatever they needed in order to remove any barriers. So the same therapist that worked with the, ch the child in the RTC would also work with the child after discharge and 90 days after, um, 90 days into the home after discharge. So that 90 days was kind of an arbitrary um, um, set number of how, how long we would stay with the case, but we found that uh, we just stay with the case as long as it's needed. And when we can safely transition them to um, community providers, that's what we do. Our outcomes to date are pretty exciting to me. Um, we've had 62 participants um, in the Building Bridges project. Uh, seven currently are still at residential, nine discharged, uh, and remain in aftercare. Of the 55, which includes that nine discharged, 10 were negative. Uh, five were to other out-of-home placements, and uh, we know that the first three kids we worked with in our Building Bridges project were uh, discharged to other out-of-home placements instead of home. And what we learned from that, uh, YDI is famous for its ready, fire, aim approach, um, was, was that we needed to stay in the home longer periods of time so we really knew uh, what the home was like and how the home was managed um, for five, six, seven, eight hours in a day, not one or two. Mm -hmm. So um, the, of the 45 that were successfully discharged, and we've, we've begun to change our definition of successful discharge. Our definition was discharge to a lower level of care, and that is reflected in our, our numbers for the Student Advisory Board and for our overall numbers of discharge home or discharge to a lower level of care. What we now count as successful discharges in our Building Bridges project, the kids that participate in that project, we um, count only the ones that return to home and family or to a um, foster family with the potential of adoption. My favorite thing is that of the 29 youth that were discharged over a year ago or more, um, only five have returned to out-of-home placements, and 23 have remained in the home. Um, this kind of computes roughly to about a $2 million savings for the system for those 23 kids not having another six to eight months of out-of-home care after they had left YDI. So we think it's very significant what we're doing.
this is the slide that's supposed to encourage you <laughs> because what people think is that we started, you know, and we knew where we were going and we went straight there. No, we really, really looked like uh, the, the arrow on the right um, that uh, we had to back up and go at it again. Again, that ready, fire, aim approach. As long as you keep doing it, um, it, it eventually gets you where you want to go. So, as I said earlier, nobody gets into residential because they want to harm children. And, and I think what Building Bridges has done for, for us is resonated with the clinician that, that masquerades as an administrator. And, and we know that what, this is best practice. This is not really an initiative. It's, it's again, another imperative. And uh, we encourage all of you to, to rethink um, what's happening in, in residential. Control is always met with counter control. That you get, you get resistance um, when you try to control a youth, especially since it's developmentally appropriate for them to resist. So um, rethinking those, those practices that are controlling and letting go of control and embracing involving kids in their treatment and, and in how the facility operates and opening the facility to um, families and, and agencies and people like you um, helps us all change. So. These are the resources that we really recommend um, that you look into. ACRC has a um, conference coming up at the end of, of April. And uh, this is where we really learned a lot of the information we have used to transform our, our services. Contact information for David and me and Maria. Um, we'll find Charlie for you if you want to talk to him. So um, thank you. And Sherry, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. And thank you, Trish. Those many, many pearls in the presentation, I think, that, that, that um, all of you referenced. I wanted to go ahead and, and I appreciate you putting on there, and I'll mention this, down on your lower left corner of your screen, if you have the screen in front of you, you have file share, and so those PowerPoints are available to download, and that would include the contact information um, too for, for YDI. There was an earlier question that Priscilla had <coughs> that's probably to you, Trish or David, that was um, how long is an average length of stay at, at YDI? That, that depends on the program. Uh, the kids that are in the journey program for uh, sexually abusive behavior uh, generally are here anywhere from 14 to it's, it's climbing upwards to about 20 months. Um, the kids that are here in our general mental health programs are usually here between four and six months. Okay, thank you. And then I think there was a follow-up question from Priscilla on um, how is the discharge rate calculated? And I think that was in reference to a slide on the student advisory board slide. That's yeah, and, and as I said, we, um, what our measure has been, has been leaving successfully to a lower level of care. Um, so we, we are now looking at defining that, particularly for the kids involved in the Building Bridges Project, is leading to family and a home and uh, remaining there in a permanent situation. Okay, thank you for that. And I think there was a question about downloading and, and Glenn will um, help you with that and we can certainly <coughs> send that back out to folks um, since we've got folks registered. If there's a additional questions, please type those in the chat box at this time and we'll address those um, accordingly. I appreciate you, I think I mentioned this, but the six core strategies, because you had referenced that, and so there was a link to that on the end of the slide at YDI that really lays those out succinctly, because I know you had sp spoke to those. So Jason had a, a question about how has your direct care retention rate increased since you made the changes, and, and if, sh if so, where are they at now? Um, the, the change in that is not significantly noticeable. Um, we have a, a, about, like I said, a, about 160 youth care workers. About 80 of those uh, have been with us for quite some time, two, three, five. Charlie, how long have you been here? Probably about 15 years. 15. Maria, 16 years. So a lot of our staff uh, 
okay, uh, stay here. Um, but we also have the big the beginning youth care workers, we hire graduates from college uh, with behavioral health degrees, and uh, we train them um, in, in what we do here, uh, rather than hire people who have behavioral health experience. So naturally, we're a springboard and, and the training site for most of the people in behavioral health um, in Maricopa County in Arizona. Thank you for that. Uh, another question, and I know this has come up, I know when we've done a um, focus group with some youth. <laughs> the question is, are, are the residents allowed to use their cell phones? No, we don't, we don't allow cell phone use. We do allow the, the MP3 players because we give them to them and we control basically the music that they can hear. Um, but that again goes through student advisory board um, to determine what music is appropriate and not appropriate for the environment. And so can you speak to, um, on a follow-up to that, Trish, can you speak to how um, the young people are able to get in touch with families or how that's managed, families or friends? Or Yeah, all, all of our kids have what are called contact lists, and anyone that is on their contact list has to be approved by their guardian, and if uh, they have a, a probation officer involved and also by their probation officer, um, but we allow phone calls uh, in the evenings at any time. Uh, we allow visitation uh, at any time. We, again, like I said, we try to be very open. And one of the things that we do in a de-escalation is to offer to call a family member and um, get the kid in contact with their, with their family. Okay, so that it sounds like you do that on a nightly basis. Mm -hmm. So there's yeah. a... A question about um, how, how many, um, Ingrid is asking, how many in the study group were privately placed and how many did the state place and um, were they close in proximity from where the family lives, I think, to... All, to all of our kids are funded by public agencies, so through either the Medicaid funding, uh, Title 19, or through state funding for um, Department of Child Services or the uh, Arizona Supreme Court for probationers. So all are, all are publicly funded. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and yeah, we, the furthest we've gone is uh, probably Tucson is 110 miles away. So we've had a few kids in the Building Bridges program that were in Tucson. And um, we've gone up to Prescott, which is another about 190 miles away um, for, for other kids. We also take kids um, just kind of ad hoc. We've taken kids to their home or sent them home, um, even if they were as far away as 500 miles. So um, we do that as, as needed. Okay. Thank you. And I, I think as a, in follow-up or clarifying, it, did the state have custody of any of the, um, the youth in your study group? Yes. Yes. I don't have the data on exactly how many, but for the, for a, probably at least half of the group at, at intake, the parents were not an option for placement after discharge. Um, they had already um, backed away from the kid and had experienced several failures with them. So it was a we had to do a lot of engagement uh, with those parents to get them reinvolved with their kid and and to show them that there was a different way um, to handle them. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so um, another question from Marsha is how are the youth chosen for the Youth Advisory Council? Um, it's a cool question. They choose themselves. Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. Um, they hear and they see um, how the kids get involved, how they get a choice, and they can actually influence where they live. And they'll ask, well, how do I do that? And then they just kind of see what the kind of operational rules are and then they come in and experience it. Yeah, our only criteria is that the kid not be disruptive during the meeting. And as long as they can maintain that, we don't have any other behavioral criteria mm -hmm. that is placed on them. And the, the kids select themselves um, and they are then approved by the kids currently on the student advisory board. From time to time, um, one of the clinicians or administrators will, will arbitrarily place someone, 
on the Student Advisory Board because we feel like they would benefit from being able to have a positive outlet for um, their expression of rebellion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I appreciate what you were saying earlier that it's not based on behavior on whether they are on or not too. So that was that's good clarification. How many are on the, the advisory council? How many? Um, previously we were running between 12 to 14, but since we were trying to get more kids in, since we changed kind of how we're using it, 16, I think right now we have 18. We're at capacity probably about 20 to 24. Okay. So we're trying to get ourselves up to. Great. Um, and and I'm Ingrid, I'm going to come back to your question in a minute and as we talk about the council and have Charlie, is there a time frame for, for participation on the advisory council or do young people actually, roll in? Yeah, there is now actually, so we can get more kids involved like to talk about that new initiative. Um, we put a time frame on about somewhere between four to six months depending on the kid. So four to six months, okay, great. Yeah. Oh yeah, in fact, when we talked about... That's a really important thing. Um, when we talked about turning this into being a more of a therapeutic module, the kids actually came with a time frame, what they figured they would need to get good at the job and what would get more of their peers involved in it. So That's great. There, there isn't a, you must be here 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. There's, there's not a criteria like that. Any kid can ask to join at any time. Okay, great. Good information. Thank you so much. And these are great questions too. Um, Ingrid was wanting to follow up. How how have you worked with the state on the permanency plan? I'm I'm sure that's speaking to the the kids that are in state custody that you have in your program. So how are you working with the state? Um, their permanency plan. A lot of the kids come in with uh, with family reunification as their DCS goal. Mm -hmm. um, but that hasn't occurred yet or is stalled, um, and, and we find a way to restart that process. Uh, usually by engaging the parents, we, we take them to, to um, get drug tested or we um, help them clean out the house so they're not hoarding anymore. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we do lots of different things to re-engage the parents and, and who have been um, resentful of the system. Mm -hmm. um, prior to coming to us. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So really looking on that, it sounds like collaboratively um, in partnership with the, the oversight agency as well. Marcia, yes. yes. Oh, I'm sorry, did you have something else, Maria? I just think, I just think it really starts at admission and I think that we, we try to meet with them at admission when, if they're involved. So for us, it's DCS. So if DCS is involved and we meet with them at admission, we try to get a good idea then what their plan is. And um, if it's not, if there isn't family involved, then we try to start investigating too with the family search and engage. And then if we can find somebody, um, because we know that, that DCS is also has their hands full with many cases, however we can help them out. If we can relieve them and find somebody, then we will do that as well. Um, One of the other things we do is we offer to supervise either therapeutically or, or just with our youth care worker staff, um, either have a clinician or a youth care worker directly supervise any contact with a family member right. that DCS has questions about. And this has been a successful re-engagement strategy for us. Yeah. That's great. Good, good, good input, good questions. Um, along those same lines, how involved are parents or caretakers in the overall process? You've spoken a lot about, you know, the student advisory um, group and all, but how, how are our families and, um, or parents or caretakers involved? Not as much yet as we would like. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have family days uh, once a month in which we have family education and um, a meal and, and the kids present on things that they're doing in treatment. Um, we have some family support group work going on, um, mm -hmm. but we don't really have family support partners. They're sometimes furnished to us by the system itself, by the mm -hmm. uh, behavioral health system. Um, so family engagement is an area that we still are struggling to, to um, mm -hmm. do our best with. And, and just to add to that, this is very, I know that there are some other programs that have had great 
success that um, BBI has worked with that that echo your success with your um, student advisory. They have family um, there as partners in helping drive policies and practices as well. So I think it's almost you know a similar um, partnership. But like you say, it's it's an incremental process. I think a, a similar question is: Does part of the collaboration include group or family therapy with the the parents or caretakers? Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, family therapy is is always included if there is a family available yeah. for the, for that, and that is driven by the treatment planning process. So. Yeah. Okay. And there was a question from Joey about. Um, any additional info on the consequences or level system change that was made? And because you had mentioned that you you don't. We never really had a points program. We had, well, Dave and I go back pretty far. Um, we we met at the Austin State Hospital when we were both working on the children's psychiatric unit. So uh -huh. back in the 70s. So right. you know we've we've implemented lots of points programs, and and we know um, and we knew. From, from the beginning of YDI that we didn't want to do that because uh, uh, we know how much trouble <laughs> they, they create in a residential environment. Um, most, a lot of restraints result from a kid getting dropped a level or not earning his points. Um, we had a, a system of um, progress and treatment uh, dictating levels of privilege, and we just did away with it one day. We just said, we're not going to do that anymore. Everybody gets the same level of privileges, and that's what it took. We do a lot of, um, a lot more focus on relationships. So if you, if you hurt somebody's feelings or you insult them, then you have to do repairs on relationships. So you have to do repairs, mediations, the grievances, going through student advisory to settle grievances. So um, we do a lot more with that in terms of relationships. We do a lot more focus on treatment plans. So what are your objectives on your treatment plan? We do a lot more of progress. How are you doing in family therapy? What is your progress in group? So there's more focus on the treatment plan, more focus on repairs. When you um, damage a relationship, you have to go back and repair it, or if you have an argument with somebody mediating it. Um, so we do more of those types of things rather than taking away stuff from them. And, and then a lot more on about safety. So are you safe? Safety starts inside of you. Is your behavior safe? What are you doing to be safe? That sounds like that those the individualized approaches would really strengthen um, young people regulating, you know, self-regulation and preparation for being back in the community as well. Right. Opposed to levels. Those things are transferable. Those right. are things you can take That's home with you. Yes. Way to say it. That's great. There's a, a, Jason had a question about um, do the kids partic participate? in particular staff training with your staff, um, like um, trauma-informed care, CPS, are they, are they able to provide their unique perspectives in those training forums or venues? Absolutely. In fact, I think that we've made it a point to ask the kids what are, their, what are their takes or what are their opinions on certain things or implementing this or how is this going. So it goes beyond just the initial new hire training they participated in revision, revising staff trainings as well. Yeah, they actually trained the staff how to do better groups that were more interesting. <laughs> so that was that was very helpful. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's great. Great questions coming in. Leanne has one. Are there um, any efforts made to reintegrate young people back into the community school, or and especially transitions prior to this discharge? I know you had mentioned in your presentation that when they get closer to discharge, but I guess along the way, are there efforts made to reintegrate them? Yes. So prior to discharge, um, we, um, as the principal here at YDI, because um, most of the kids have an IEP or a great deal of them do, will meet um, and make contact with the home school. They will have a meeting um, in regards to the IEP and decide on the best setting for the kids in the community schools. And then um, if the community school is in agreement, 
We will um, start them in their community school, um, and um, we will also have a time period of them where they are actually living at home um, and um, can going to school from home with um, like a behavior coach checking in with them during the week um, to make sure that they are doing well at, at the home school. Um, so we do have that type of um, reintegration back into the community so that the home school has our contact information if anything should happen. Um, the parents are, have our contact information. The behavior coach is still checking on the kids. Um, so they have some time in the community school for that transition. The other thing, though, is, is if a kid can function at a school um, in the community, uh, they don't really need to be in an RTC. No. <laughs> so so uh, those, those transitions happen very close to discharge within, you know, probably at the most six weeks of, of discharge, right. sometimes a lot less than that. But mm -hmm. we do ensure through the, the programming that mm -hmm. there's a smooth transition to the school, no matter whether the kid is involved in the Building Bridges project or not. Right. And is there voice included in what the school needs to look to look like? Um, yes. Okay. Yes, they're involved in the meeting because usually it is a child and family team meeting um, where the a representative from the home school will will come in and um, meet with the team. Okay, that's great. I know in working with other programs around the country that sometimes the funding source, and this is why it's important when we're looking at um, systems transformation in general that we're working with oversight oversight agencies but sometimes the funding flow um, may limit the time in the community that um, the residential provider or treatment providers are allowed to make and I think our philosophy at BBI is the more the better so that they can make a successful transition. So the more time that is supported to be, you know, that you can be in homes and communities, you know, that um, is the better with especially looking with discharge, a successful discharge being in mind. So Marsha had a question about what is the role of the therapist during the visit with the behavior coach after the young person returns home during the monitoring period? So initially they will go into the home um, together while the child is still here in residential. Um, and they will do that in order to assess the needs of the home. But after discharge, the therapist and behavior coach will be going into the home separately. So the therapist will be going into the home to provide individual and family therapy. The behavior coach will be going into the home to provide um, the coaching for the parents and to make sure that the family is practicing um, problem solving skills, collaborative problem solving skills, um, making sure that they're following their daily schedule, um, making sure um, if there were successes in the problem solving, like what were the successes, are there any barriers to like attending psychiatric appointments, going to school, um, so just checking in with the family and seeing um, are there any barriers to connecting with other community resources like a YMCA or any after school programs, um, anything that the, the family needs in order to uh, reach the point where they're able to function without other people interfering. Um, and so the behavior coach helps with that. The therapist is still providing the therapy after discharge. That's a, a great response and I know that in in some other programs that we've worked with as well is that you know wrap child and family wraparound teams that um, are consistent with the teams that are in the community and keeping the same team with the residential intervention is helpful in kind of driving um, that continuity as far as those behavior plans and and right and all as well. So that's, I know that that in Texas, that that's something that we've really invested a lot in with wraparound training and, and wraparound teams. So that's, that would be something to look at as far as those teams being transferable to residential interventions and back and forth. So very helpful, very good questions. Thank you for your, your responses as well. 
you know, one of the other great things is that um, if the therapist or the behavior coach, if neither one can respond to a crisis, because the child is one of ours and knows the staff and the other, like the milieu coordinators here and, and everyone, anyone can respond to that crisis. So if it's a day where the therapist or the behavior coach is maybe with another family, because the child knows so many people here, anyone can, um, anyone that they can feel comfortable with can respond to the crisis should the family be in a crisis. So that's one of the other advantages of us doing the aftercare. That's great. That's good. I see we've got Leanne Topping. We probably have time for one more question before we wrap up and, and um, give you some sneak previews of what's coming and, <laughs> and um, further information. So any additional questions? And I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to um, thank, <laughs> thank you, Leanne, too. So I think we didn't open the, the phone lines. Those are sometimes challenging to, to manage with background noise and all. So I really appreciate the rich questions that came through the chat box. Um, you have all the contact information here. And again, if you have any trouble with downloading the files on the file share, please let myself, Glenn, Lillian, um, someone know, and we can assist and just send that to you in an email. So at this time, I just want to say thank you so much to YDI and the, the exceptional team that you have there um, with David and Trish and, and Maria and Charlie and, and Brittany um, all the way down. And thank you for sharing your expertise. I'm going to turn it back over to Lillian. And I want to thank um, YDI and Sherry for putting today's webinar together. And I'm excited to continue working with the Texas RTCs to see how we can implement what we learned today. And I hope that you are also excited to put the, these ideas into practice and to have the youth in your facilities become more involved in their own care. Um, coming up, our next webinar will be held on Thursday, March 9th at 1 o'clock until 2.30 p.m. Central Time. And it, the title will be Partnering with Families Through Family-Driven Practices. And that webinar will feature Sherry Hammock and also the St. Mary's Home for Children, a residential program in Rhode Island. And the Save the Date information for that webinar will be um, distributed very soon to all of you. Um, at this time, um, we will adjourn. And please remember to fill out the application as you close the webinar system. And social work CEUs are available to those of you who would like them. Mm -hmm. And again, thank you very much for your participation. And we hope to see you on the March 9th 